Welcome back to my channel. I thought it would be fun today to, well, I guess not fun, but an interesting experiment to read some of the reviews of the Tortured Poets Department. Specifically, I kind of wanted to focus on the Pitchfork review because it rated Tortured Poets as a 6.6. .6, and I honestly started reading like the first few lines of this review and I was like, this is not okay with me. And so I wanted to read it for you guys and maybe give my thoughts and opinions. There were three specific reviews that I found fascinating, two of which I don't even want to pay to get through to read them. They were from the New York Times and one of them was called The Tortured Poets Department, Taylor Swift Could Use an Editor. And the other one was entitled, Taylor Swift Has Given Fans a Lot, Is It Finally Too Much? Now, one of the absolute best video responses I've seen of this review or these reviews from the New York Times is from a creator on TikTok called The Thrifty Swifty. You guys probably already know who she is. I think her name is Jenny, but she encapsulated this so perfectly that I want to play a little clip of what she said because basically not only did the New York Times get Taylor Swift's album name wrong, they spent the whole article calling it the Torture Poet Society and then they finally corrected it. So who could use an editor? And then also some of the complaints that I looked up on Reddit of people talking about the New York Times article was that they thought the content to be like petty or mundane and I feel like that is a very surface level listen of the Torture Poets Department and it doesn't really understand the depth of what this album is and so it clearly missed the mark in my opinion. I just want to play this video because I thought it was so funny. Today the New York Times wrote and published an article entitled Taylor Swift has given fans a lot is it finally too much and in their eagerness to criticized Taylor for releasing 31 songs, a double album that has absolutely smashed records. They called it the Tortured Poets Society instead of the Tortured Poets Department. And yes, a lot of us have done that, but we're not the New York Times. We don't have 5,900 employees. We're just modern idiots. Taylor Swift has given us a lot. And if you think it's too much, go find less. That is one of my favorite lines. If you think the Tortured Poets Department is too much, go find less. Like, mic drop. So good. Anyway, I wanted to read the Pitchfork review because from what I've heard from other people, it is one of the fairest of the negative reviews. And I think it's important to actually talk about reviews in general because I have worked in journalism and writing for quite a few years now. One of the frustrating parts about these types of things is that not only are writers encouraged or oftentimes forced to write an article under very, very strict deadlines, they are persuaded or pushed to take a very strong opinion. So if you're listening to the Torture Post Department and you don't love it, your article needs to show that you kind of hated it. And it has to be a stronger opinion because that's the type of headline clickbait that gets views. Many of the reviews that came out on the Torture Post Department came out within like a day later. That's not even an hour per song. It's physically impossible to actually give this amount of work the attention it deserves in that short amount of time, which I personally think is why so many of the the reviewers were frustrated by the fact that so many extra songs were added because you basically just doubled their workload. I think they just thought it was too much. They were fed up with it. They weren't coming from the place of genuine listeners and Swifties and fans who wanted songs and wanted art from a creator. It was like the more Taylor created, the more work that they had to do because they were, you know, being forced to review it. And I felt like the positive reviews were from Swifties. And one of the things that stood out to me is if the positive reviews review subtly reference back to older songs, older eras, things in the fandom that happened a decade ago even, I felt like they were the ones that truly got it because they clearly have been around for a long time and didn't feel this need to create a facade of like love or hate. Like they just were actually genuinely reviewing it from the type of place that they should be. I will say, I'll save this for the end of the video, but I did decide to write a review myself on my blog. And if you want to check it out, it's called thepoeticapothecary.com, but I'll read it at the end of this video for you guys because it's not great at all. It was just something I started writing because I had a lot of thoughts and a lot of frustrations about the feedback I was reading, and I wanted to put my two cents into the universe. I know no one's gonna probably see it, but I just like having it as a little time capsule, so I will read that for you guys at the end if you're curious about what I would like to say. I have not done this type of writing before. Every article that I write tends to be third person. You're not really allowed to put your opinion 
opinion into it. It has to be more fact-based. So it was really fun to be able to put my thoughts and opinions into a piece of art that I was reviewing in such a personal way. But at the same time, I think sometimes I can get lost in the weeds of everything I know about Taylor Swift and the cinematic universe and the lore and all of that. From my perspective, it probably would be a good idea to have an editor. So if you guys read it and have thoughts and feedback, comment it down below or comment it on my blog, I guess. I think I have comments turned on. I don't actually know. Anyway, let's get into the Pitchfork article. So the Pitchfork title is The Tortured Poets Department, The Anthology. Well, that was a creative title, I suppose. It was published April 22nd. I know these dates can change if it gets updated, but basically that's three days later. So I don't view that as enough time whatsoever. But I will say I want to start by reading this review with an open mind. I don't want to just blindly disagree for the sake of being a Swifty. I want to actually take their criticism. And the reason I find this important is because we all know that Taylor cares about her public perception. She cares about feedback. She cares about critical acclaim and reviews like this. And if people are writing negative reviews just to be rude, then those are easily dismissible. But if they are actually providing a common consensus of feedback, I think she's definitely going to take it and receive it and internalize it and like ponder it and probably try to learn and grow from it. So I kind of want to make this video as a Taylor Swift fan because I think it's important to recognize which articles are just regurgitating the same criticism that the article before them wrote because from what I have read across a lot of different articles there are so many common sayings and common phrases that I'm like oh my god you literally just regurgitated this last article that I read where's the original thought it what there wasn't any original thought so that's why there was no point in reading a ton of these articles for you guys because so many of them were very surface level and it basically just complained about a couple of lyrics that had surface level subject matter a little bit of cringe I think some of them called her like slightly self-indulgent. Some of them said that she needed an editor because it was too long of a track list or the songs were either too long or had lines that weren't ideal. And then a lot of people were criticizing her relationship with producers Jack Antonoff and Aaron Desner, which frustrates me to no end. I just don't understand the Jack Antonoff hate at all because people are acting like her working with him is getting to be too repetitive, too stale, too mundane, while at the same time criticizing sounds that have not sounded like any of her previous albums. So so it's kind of like an oxymoron and it makes no sense and so I kind of feel like they don't actually know the music that they're talking about and they have just heard this being perpetuated on the internet and they decided to add it into their review. So Taylor did repost a lot of reviews that were all positive but I also felt like some of these positive reviews were not very deep and a little bit surface level. Oh my gosh this is so interesting. I did notice that a lot of the reviews that Taylor shared and posted are clearly part of a working relationship that she has with certain outlets because it's kind of a well-known thing that if you want to get access to receive Taylor's work early and have time to create a review with care, you have to write a relatively good review. Otherwise, she's not going to want to share the review. She's not going to want to give you early access anymore and you're going to lose your relationship with her. I don't think it's that hard to find people at these different publications that like Taylor Swift and are more than happy to write a positive glowing review. But at the same time, I find it very interesting that their reviews only had the Torture Post Department and didn't talk about the anthology. So she did not leak or reveal that it was going to be a double album even to the people who she knew were going to be writing articles about her because those articles were published on I think April 19th. So like they clearly had to have early access to this album from my perspective. Anyway, let's get into the Pitchfork article. A 6.6. .6, that's like a D. That is absolutely ridiculous. That is my first impression. Honestly, I just feel like that's a ridiculous rating. Taylor Swift's music was once much bigger than her. A born storyteller, she gathered up the emotional ephemera of her life and molded it into indelible songs about herself, but also about young women, about their sorrow, their desire, their wit, and their will. She was the girl next door with the platinum pin, her feelings worth hearing about, not simply because they existed, but because she turned them into art. I do like that because it is a good point. A lot of people did not care about young girls' feelings or emotions, thought they were trivial, thought they were ridiculous, and by her turning them into art, it did slowly but surely start to make them feel like they mattered more. Those days are gone. Excuse you? Gone? You just got 31 songs. Swift, pumped up to mythical proportions by discursive oxygen, is bigger than her body of work. 
Oh, I guess I get what she's saying. So she was saying before the work was much bigger than her as a person and now she as a person is bigger than her work. Okay, I guess that's slightly fair. No knock against her body of work. She is her own pantheon, a tragic hero and a vindicated villain, an inadvertent antitrust crusader and a one woman stimulus package. That is a clever way of talking about her economic power. An alleged climate criminal and fixer, the person of the year of the girl. Over the past 13 months, she's strapped on her spangled bodysuit and performed a her clay and feet three nights a week on the highest grossing tour of all time, earning her vaunted billion dollar valuation. Her musical achievements are remarkable, but nobody makes a billion dollars from music alone. That kind of reminds me of an interview I saw with AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She is a congresswoman. She once said that you don't make a billion dollars, you take a billion dollars. And she was referencing the concept or the idea that billionaires often get their money by screwing over workers, screwing over people underneath you and making their lives basically unlivable and not fair in order to continue to grow your own wealth. And I feel like Taylor is an anomaly because she has notoriously never done that. She has been known to be an incredible boss, an incredible leader, someone who has always tipped well, tipped her employees well, provided bonuses and created a very good working environment that was very important to her. She even revealed on like David Letterman, I think when she was 20, that she was providing health insurance to her backup dancers. And that is not super common. So I feel like she's a bit of an anomaly when it comes to her billionaire status, which is why people love to argue about it. The Tortured Poets Department, Swift's 11th studio album, senses that widening gap between Taylor Swift the artist and Taylor Swift the phenomenon and wants to fill it with a fire hose of material. Well, that seems like a way to dismiss a bunch of art. I don't think Taylor Swift decided to release a double album in an effort to bridge the gap between her music and her name. The burden of expectation is substantial. That is true. Taylor has said, every time you have a new accomplishment, you're expected to accomplish more the next time. This is Swift's first body of new work since the end of a years long relationship and a pair of high profile whirlwind romances, one of which with the 1975's Maddie Healy appears to have provided much of the inspiration here. Fans came to tortured poets seeking emotional catharsis or at least the salacious details. Swift, it seems, wanted the comfort of familiarity. Uh, what? Returning to, oh, Returning to Jack Antonoff. Oh my fucking God. Are you gonna keep talking about this same dude over and over and over again? They're friends. They work together. She's not gonna reveal all of her secrets to some rando producer, guys. Like she trusts him and that's why they work so well together. And he pulls information out of her. Do you think she's gonna go to some random producer that she's never met before and be like, um, let me talk about like my deepest desires and emotional cheating? No, she's able to talk about those things with people that she knows and trusts. That is literally the point. God, people bug me. Returning to Jack Antonoff and the Nationals' Aaron Desner, her primary songwriting and producing partners of the last several years, Swift picks up threads from Folkmore and Midnight's without quite pulling anything loose. I don't understand this tone and this idea that because this album is not the same as Folklore, Evermore, or Midnight's, but has inspirations from each of those things, that it's like bad. Like picks up the threads but never pulls anything loose. Like what did you expect if she had repeated the exact same album again? You guys would have criticized that. I'm confused. Tortured Poets Extended Anthology Edition runs over two hours and even in the abridged version its sense of sprawl creeps down to the song level where Swift's writing is at best playfully unbridled and at worst conspicuously wanting for an editor. I really hope they explain this criticism because I've heard it so much and I just genuinely need an explanation. The winking title track, a joke about its subject's self-seriousness, makes fun of the performance of creative labor, which is funny given the show that Swift is putting on herself. She piles the metaphors on thick, throws stuff at the wall even after something has stuck, picks up the things that didn't stick, and then uses them anyway. <laughs> Oh my God, I know this is supposed to be like a very, very, very insulting line, but I cannot help but laugh because only Taylor Allison Swift could force something to stick to a wall that is not adhesive. Like, it's so funny to me because they're like trying to insult her, but in actuality, I feel like they're just complimenting her ability to create and create and create and create. She piles the metaphors on thick. That is not a criticism that I would give. Yes, there are metaphors throughout this album, but I feel like they are done so 
so well and so eloquently. But Daddy I Love Him is an instant highlight of Taylor's career in my opinion. Down Bad is also a really good metaphor as well. So I just don't understand. I guess I wish I could know what they mean when they say stuff was thrown at the wall and even after something stuck, she picks everything else up and uses it anyway. Like what originally do you think stuck that should have been the album? And then what do you think was forced to be included? Oh, they go on to explain. That's why we end up in Florida for no apparent reason. There is an apparent reason. What are you talking about? You clearly didn't listen to the song. I genuinely feel the more and more I've listened to it that Florida is an extremely misunderstood song. When you listen to it, it's very, very clear. Plus she even gave like an introduction to the song explaining what her inspiration was for it and how she was basically feeling like she wanted to escape her life and where do you go? You go to Florida. When I analyze the lyrics, maybe I'll do like a lyrical breakdown of that song specifically because the line barricaded in the bathroom with the bottle of wine, me and my ghosts had a marvelous time or something like that. Is that not giving such good imagery? It, it brings me back to Midnight's where she says all the people like I've ghosted stand there in the room and your hologram stumbled into my apartment from Chloe or Sam or Sophia or Marcus and the fact that she said I was a functioning alcoholic in Fortnite. It's like she was barricaded in the bathroom with a bottle of wine thinking about her ghost. To me, it is actually an extremely good song. If they wanted to talk about the production possibly getting in the way of the lyricism and the message, that would be a criticism that I could understand. But that's not what they said. They said they threw it at the wall and it was unnecessary and I don't think it was unnecessary. And the fact that she said we're in Florida for no apparent reason to me means that they did not listen to enough of the information surrounding the explanation of the album. And they didn't listen to other songs on the album because even Fortnite says move to Florida. So there's your connection there. Or in the bridge of the black dog, she says now I want to sell my house and set fire to all my clothes and hire a priest to come and exercise my demons. Like she wants to run away from the life that she has now found herself in because of everything that happened. Why the dirge? What the heck is a dirge? Lament for the dead, especially one forming part of a funeral rite. A mournful song. Okay. Why the mournful song, So Long London, names five different causes of death. That's not even one cause of death per year of the relationship. What did you want from her? That's like one of the only songs we got about the Joe breakup and you're wanting her to like summarize six and a half years into what? One reason? Five's too many? Why my boy only breaks his favorite toys is allowed to work a schoolyard premise until it cracks. I don't like this review because I feel like it's just one person's subjective opinion and it's becoming like an entire publication's review of the album. Like I don't think My Boy Only Breaks His Favorite Toys cracks because of the schoolyard metaphor. But unruliness also produces the wild wonder of But Daddy I Love Him, glad she liked that one, a spiritual descent of love story where the protagonists are knocking down castle walls instead of stealing glances in the ballroom. Desner's proposal Impulsive string arrangement and Swift's narrative marks keep the song moving even as it stretches towards six minutes. Very true. Reaching flights of fantasy unlike anything else in this album. Debatable. Swift is nimble here. Heel turning and crackling through the chorus. I'm having his baby. No, I'm not, but you should see your faces. Perhaps she's after a sort of text painting, an effort to reflect the all-consuming, unconscionable nature of her sordid affair in the shape of the music itself. Perhaps she is playing with scale, drawing a contrast between a relationship's brevity and its broad impact. Fortnite, a lethargic druggy opener with an oozy Post Malone feature, sets up both the timeline and the stakes. I love you, it's ruining my life. I touched you for only a fortnight. Is that acting like they like that song? Okay. From there, Swift assembles song by song an exquisite corpse of a love interest, a tattooed golden retriever, who smokes like a chimney and plays with guns and makes her feel like a kid again and could maybe possibly father kids of her own. He is alluring and unreliable. He has a terrible reputation. He is the conduit through which Swift returns to many of the themes that have defined her 2020s output. Marriage and commitment. Is that really something that has defined her 2020 output? Like those are not the vibes that I got from Folklore Evermore. Uh, I guess kind of. Actually, I want to revisit Folklore and Evermore because I feel like a lot of the fictional concepts in Dorothea and Tis the Damn Season and there was another one. Even like illicit affairs, I feel like there are a lot of ideas of lost love or going off to be famous and forgetting someone else 
from your hometown, I think new light could be shed on some of the fictional narratives that we were working with back then. Ooh, okay. Marriage and commitment, the currency of youth. I like that line and I've seen it in other publications as well. I literally think someone else just like stole that. I also added something similar in mine because I figured if everyone else is doing it, why can't I? The cruelty of public opinion. There is a clear emphasis here on vulnerability. It's an effort to rub some of the varnish off of Taylor Swift, the commercial product and focus on Taylor Swift, the tender, unlucky romantic with whom we fell in love with so many years ago. I do not like this narrative whatsoever because I feel like it paint Taylor as a very calculated person who focuses more on her public perception than she does on the art that she's creating and the genuine place of creativity that she's working from. And I think more than anything, this album is a step away from her over fixating on public opinion, public perception. I think with Vault songs, we have seen during the Red album, she didn't put on nothing new. She didn't put on I Bet You Think About Me. And I think there were very specific reasons for why those narratives were a avoided back then for her career and I think it was the right choice. However, I think now more than anything because she is so big and because she is so popular and well liked and well known, she doesn't have to be as guarded or as contrived when it comes to what art she is willing to put on her album. If she wrote it and if she's proud of it, she's going to release it and I think that is the most powerful and freeing thing that she can do as an artist of her stature and to act like Taylor the commercial product is almost practicing like strategic vulnerability in order to mask how out of touch and out of reach she is, is discrediting her work, in my opinion. No matter her stature, Swift can still reach the every woman. She is versed in meme speak, down bad works because the juxtaposition between its banal hook and its description of cosmic love. The corporate girlies will go feral for, I cry a lot, but I am so productive. I can do it with a broken heart. So true, totally makes sense. Her songs are relatable. I can even get on board with the outlaw machinations of I can fix him, no really I can. Love that song, if mostly for the lyrical backflip of its chorus. They shook their heads saying, God help her when I told him he's my man, but your good Lord didn't need to lift a finger. I could fix him. No, really, I can. I've touched on how much I love that song. Glad it was recognized. Swift would have us believe that this album represents an unprecedented level of access to her inner life, an exorcism of her true feelings about a relationship whose general outline is widely recognizable. I've never had an album where I needed songwriting more than I needed it on Tortured Poets. She told an audience in Melbourne ahead of the release. I think this is actually a really good point to touch on the fact that yes, so many people thought that this album was going to be about her Joe breakup and be somewhat of an exorcism of her true feelings about that relationship that so many of us kind of knew the outlines of. But just because that wasn't the case does not mean that we are not given access into her inner life. It's just we projected incorrect emotions onto her and now we are being given her true thoughts and true emotions about what she was feeling and going through during the time that she wrote this. A lot of which is directed at the fans and the people that are listening. Remember though that she has been using songs to litigate her private affairs with public figures since her breakup with Joe Jonas in 2008. What's changed is not the intimate writing. Okay, good. I'm glad you've touched on that. It's the appetite for the minutia of Swift's life and the sheer quantity of material she's feeding it with. Clues and keywords that might once have been left for the liner notes are littered throughout the lyrics. If you know, you know. If you don't, please choose from any of the hundreds of explainers. I don't really understand the point of this part because to me all this is saying is that she is getting more raw, more vulnerable, more candid with her lyrics in her actual songs. She's not leaving things in the liner notes. She's directly telling it to us through lyrics, which she's always done. And plus, did you read the epilogue of the vinyl that we got? Like she fully spelled it out. Everything that was going on in so much detail. She is so vulnerable and so candid with us. So I guess I should just keep reading. It's not Swift's fault that we're so obsessed with her. Well, 
maybe that's the part where you're wrong because it is kind of her fault that we're so obsessed with her. From the very beginning, I feel like Taylor worked on crafting this parasocial relationship so unbelievably well. She was posting on her MySpace page. She was directly messaging fans and commenting on their stuff online. She was doing secret sessions where they were invited to her house. She was giving clues in the liner notes of her albums that spelled out direct names of people. She made it feel and seem like we were her best friend and that was her biggest success. It largely is her fault that we are so obsessed with her because it was part of her brand and her nature of wanting that connection and feeling so close to us and having us feel so close to her with her music and the way she interacts with us. I do think though that as she got bigger and it moved beyond just fans that truly cared about her and moved on to people who only wanted to gossip and didn't actually care, it got a little bit out of hand, which she probably didn't foresee. But this album gives the impression that she can't quite hear herself over the roar of the crowd. No, it doesn't. Like at all. What are you talking about? I feel like this is one of the most self-aware albums that she's written. Who is afraid of little old me? Is her hearing herself loud and freaking clear? That is just not true. I feel like this is trying to paint her as someone who is so out of touch with her fans. I feel like out of any album, this is the one where she is so self-aware and she does hear herself and she does know herself and she knows what she wants to say and she knows what she needs to say. Literally in Who's Afraid of Little Old Me, it is one of the most impactful songs because she is so clearly setting those boundaries and making a commentary on what society and the media does to female artists who have their life picked apart. Like to me, it is the complete opposite of her not being able to hear herself over the roar of the crowd. Like, I think it's her speaking directly to the crowd in a lot of ways. Tear jerkers like So Long London and LOML fall short when every lyric carries the same weight. Carries the same weight? What? How did you not feel the build of those songs, the emotional resonance that grew over time? There's no hierarchy of tragic detail. These songs fail to distill an overarching emotional truth. What? Get a step stool, get a ladder. What are you talking about? There's no hierarchy. These songs fail to distill an overarching emotional truth, tending to smother rather than to sting. If you're getting smothered, I am truly sorry, but that is not the truth. That is not the truth whatsoever at all. Maybe this is just because I'm an empath, but I feel like some people just cannot handle handle a lot of emotions and that is okay but I do not like this idea that emotions smother rather than sting. You swore that you loved me but where were the clues? I died on the altar waiting for the proof. You sacrificed us to the gods of your bluest days and I'm just getting color back into my face? LOML loss of my life? You shit talked me under the table talking rings and talking cradles? I wish I could unrecall how we almost had it all? Dancing phantoms on the terrace? Are they secondhand embarrassed that I can't get out of bed because something counterfeit is dead? I'm Combing through the braids of lies I'll never leave, never mind. Our field of dreams engulfed in fire. Your arsons match your somber eyes and I'll still see it until I die. You're the loss of my life. There's no hierarchy of tragic detail. Build a ladder and climb to the bridge. <sighs> promised myself I wouldn't get worked up. Okay. It would help if Swift were exploring new musical ideas, but she is largely treading old territory. Unsurprising, perhaps, given the fact that the last three years of her life have been consumed by re-recording her old albums and touring her past selves. Okay, what? I feel like this is such a bad and dismissive way of talking about nostalgia and the pain of regret and the pain of like the what ifs and the if onlys and exploring the different life paths that you could have taken but chose not to and then like mourning the loss of your youth that you'll never get back and realizing that time is so finite like these are all deeply emotional relatable concepts that are just kind of dismissed as old territory and not new musical ideas but I also feel like it is extremely new and extremely different because while yes Taylor has always talked about the idealization of the love story and of marriage and the white picket fence and all that stuff when she was in Midnight's she was talking about your picket fence is sharp as knives and saying the 1950s shit they want from me and really having a more cynical look at the perfect love story and American dream and I think it was very reflective of where she was at in her life at that time and this is a completely new more evolved perspective of like her desperately wanting that stuff still being upset by the societal expectations that are placed on her as a 30 something year old woman and at the same time mourning the fact that she's running out of time and not having those milestones in life that she has always wanted and allowing herself to still want those things even though it feels like the prophecy is that she'll never have them and that she'll never find her soulmate. These are such good songs! I don't know what you're talking about! 
about? The new music is colored in familiar shades of Antonoff. Give me a freaking break! If they bring up Jack Antonoff one more time, I'm literally going to drive myself crazy. This is ridiculous. They have just jumped on the, this bandwagon of hating him for no apparent reason and it's now become like a thing and I really dislike it because their work together is so good and evolutionary. Ugh! The new music is colored in familiar shades of Antonoff. Sparse drum programming, twinkly sinks, and Desner, suppler more strings. Songs sound like other songs. Songs sound like other songs. I can do it with a broken heart like Midnight, Mastermind, the intro of So Long London, like that of Folklore's My Tears Ricochet. Her melodies feel staid, serious, boring, and slightly old fashioned. <sighs> Her melodies feel staid, boring and old fashioned. Like they are made to fit the music rather than the other way around. Um, disagree. But this is what I don't understand because you're saying I can do it with a broken heart is too similar to Midnight's Mastermind and that So Long London is too similar to Folklore's My Tears Ricochet. But then at the same time, in the same breath, you say that the Daddy I Love Him is similar to Love Story, but that's a good thing. So why is that a good thing and this not a good thing? I just feel like it's so subjective and doesn't make sense to me because to me, calling it back to her older work. I mean, My Tears Ricochet is one of my favorite songs that she's ever written. So I don't understand why it's a negative thing that So Long London is being compared to that at all. Her melodies do not feel old to me. Like they are made to fit the music. Blah, blah, blah. Also familiar are Swift's tortured ideas about her own public image. The morbidly sexy Antonoff joint Guilty as Sin has her drowning in the Blue Nile, borrowing the backbeat of the downtown lights. Oh, I didn't know that. And comparing herself to Jesus. Well, if the shoe fits, crucified for her trysts. On Who's Afraid of Little Old Me, the imagery is convoluted. No, it's not. Swift is both a defanged circus animal and a witch who put narcotics into all of her songs. Duh, because she's freaking talking about what the media talks about her. She's literally using the imagery and the comparisons that are often drawn about her in the media and then twisting it and putting it into a song and literally making like a statement about what they're saying about her. If you think the images are convoluted, then maybe you need to read another news article. I did not find the imagery to be convoluted whatsoever. I thought that that was some of her best imagery, levitating down the street, crash the party, like a record scratch as I scream? Who's afraid of little old me? Maybe you should be. Just saying, just saying. I need to calm down. I'm being too loud. <laughs> the Swift of I Can Do It With A Broken Heart is more fun, but still creepy. It's not creepy. A glittering zombie under stage lights smiling as she rots away inside. <laughs> It's only sad because I feel bad. It is so good. I actually, that might be my favorite line. A glittering zombie under stage lights smiling as she rots away inside. That is poetic. That is poetic. I will give you that line. I liked that one. Swift the workhorse, Swift the beacon of capitalism, Swift on a never ending conveyor belt between the stage and the studio. Oh my god, it's like all you can eat sushi. This is the Swift that brings us the Torture Poets Department, the anthology. Oh my god, it's the Swift that I love, okay? I just love her in her productive era. I don't know why everyone is criticizing it. I love that she said, if you stay ready, you never have to get ready. And that is, from an artist's perspective, so poetic and so true. I feel like artists in general often overthink and criticize every move they make, everything they put out, every decision is so massive in its scale. And when you just stay ready and you just keep doing things, it's so much easier to do it. And there are so many times where I go full force into a creative project and then halfway through I start second guessing myself and then it ends up dissipating into nothingness. And if you just stayed ready and kept putting it out and putting it out, you don't have time to like second guess yourself, which I find to be so important. And I feel like what people are overlooking is how important this is in her stage of her career now because while the pandemic was horrible and awful for so many people I feel like it was a very necessary pause and break from the constant cycle of putting albums out and it allowed so much of what the music industry is to be stripped back and it allowed Taylor to go back to her roots of like what it actually meant to just create songs and to authentically put them out into the world without so much of the media machine backing her and doing so much promo and just kind of surprise dropping an album or two. And I just think that that was the catalyst for her realizing that not everything needs to be so thought through. I don't like using the word calculated, but like it does have a negative connotation
creation when you are stifling your creativity and stifling yourself because you are constantly in your head and you have other people in your head. And to me, I feel like this is a very big, amazing breakthrough moment of like her finally being able to take the reins herself. And I think that is, I guess what people are criticizing is that it would be beneficial or helpful for her to slow down and like think a little bit more. But when I was watching her perform the Torture Poets Department set on the Eras Tour, I just remember thinking she created these songs, created the costumes and the set design and everything, learned the choreography and put this into an already functioning production within less than a year. And I just find that to be so amazing when she can like just put her head down and work and do what she wants to see a vision through. I'm on the conveyor belt. Like I'm loving my time. This is the Swift that brings us the Tortured Poets Department, the anthology. Maximally bloated with 15, 15 additional songs. Those that stand out mostly do so for the wrong reasons. Factually incorrect. There's the one that borrows its premise from a... Excuse me? Borrows its premise from Olivia Rodrigo? Please. She 1000% clearly wrote this song before Olivia's song was even out. It's obvious. But executes it less skillfully is also incorrect. That song is so so unbelievably good. I was just re-listening to it today and oh my god, the musicality of it, the sound, the vibe, the feel, it does something to my soul, okay? So to say it does it less skillfully than Olivia Rodrigo, I feel like is frustratingly comparing two female artists unnecessarily. They're different songs that I would listen to for different reasons and I find them both to be good, but for different reasons. The one where Swift dwells on her resentment toward Kim Kardashian, again, I've said this before, I genuinely think it's about someone from her childhood. And I think Kim is a red herring, but that's just my opinion. The one with that weird lyric about racism in the 1830s. Oh my god, you're missing the point of the song. She was, I'm not even gonna go into it. Again, I just feel like this is taking the most common surface level criticisms from the immediate release of the album and throwing them into this paragraph. This data dump release strategy is not at all unique to Swift. It's a concession to the modern music economy, which incentivizes artists to batch as many songs as possible in as many packages as possible to juice streams and sales. I mean, I was on the edge of my seat when Billie Eilish and Taylor Swift were fighting for that top spot. And I just honestly, I thought it was really really cool. I like seeing healthy competition. I like seeing two female artists fighting for streams and sales and really being proud of their work and then offering things to fans. And I mean, I guess you could make an argument about like overconsumption and stuff, but I needed those early recordings of Taylor's songs. So I'm very, very, very glad that we have them. I also need the Tortured Poets Department, the anthology on vinyl. Taylor, if you're listening. I look back fondly on the more modest tactics of our song. We're going back to 2006 to talk about streaming. The last track on Swift's debut, where she literally sang, play it again in the final chorus. Okay, what's the point? I'm confused. Oh, are they saying like, just play the song again? We don't need new songs. You can do both. We can have new songs and play the old songs, which is what I've been doing for a month. If Swift believes that output for its own sake is what she has to offer, she underestimates her gift. I don't think that's what she believes though. I think she is putting out things that she is immensely and deeply proud of. But I do like the fact that you say she's gifted. Listeners who believe that her every ounce of experience is inherently interesting because she was the one to have it misunderstand her as well. Okay, interesting. That is an interesting line. And I guess I do agree with that. Just because it's something that Taylor Swift did does not mean it is interesting. But I feel like sometimes people don't look into the deeper meaning of what her her experiences can do or mean for other people. And that was one of the foundational elements of her songwriting was the fact that she took her mundane, real life, everyday experiences, put them into songs, made art from them, and other people were able to relate to them because of that. Not everyone dated someone in high school named Drew, but we get the teardrops on my guitar song with the name drop and it was deeply resonant because of the specificity. And so I think it's definitely a fine line between realizing that not every experience is necessarily interesting enough on its own, but also searching for what that deeper meaning is in the overall story of the song and even the album. Taylor Swift doesn't need a whole album to tell the story of a relationship. That is actually where you're very wrong. She needs two albums. She only needs one song, sometimes even one line. She almost has it in Tortured Poets title track. I feel like this person really liked the title track, which I'm actually kind of shocked by. She almost has it in Tortured Poets title track with the tossed off brilliance of 
we're modern idiots. She's nearly there with the vignette, which needs a bit more burnishing, about a man slipping a ring from her middle to her eager left ring finger at dinner. You can see what she's chasing here, the moment in time that triggers a flash of feeling that lasts forever, the sort of thing people call Swiftian. We've been students of Swift's poetry for years. The lesson of the Torture Poets Department is not to push through the pain, it's to take the time to process it. Okay, but I feel like that ending is so misleading because I feel like they did not take the time to process the 31 songs before writing a review, which again is just the nature of published articles right now. Like they were not going to be given time. They reviewed this on April 22nd, so they had the 19th, 20th, 21st. So they had like three days to write it before it got published the next day. I do not feel like that is enough time to sit with the overall lesson that you left readers with, which was take the time to process it. Although, so I, I do actually really appreciate that ending, which is basically touching on the fact that it took 31 songs for Taylor to process everything that she was going through in the midst of the chaotic last year that she had. Overall, I thought this was a very decent review, relatively well balanced, frequently off on a lot of the points that they were making, but I didn't feel like it was unnecessarily off or wrong or mean or critical for the sake of being critical. I felt like this person definitely knew a decent amount of Swift's discography and just hit the mark in my opinion at certain points. But at the same time, I do feel like music is so subjective and it is fun and interesting to read different reviews and to see which songs resonate with listeners and which ones stand out as good or bad and why? Who wrote this? Olivia Horn. I like the fact that the title track stood out to Olivia and it's honestly growing and growing on my list. I told you guys when I made my ranking after one month of having Tortured Poets that it was going to change and it's already changed so much. There are so many songs that I'm like this needed to be higher already. I think the more I sit with the album as a whole and the more I understand the story that was going on and what was happening and the details that each individual song provides and even specific verses or or bridges in the different songs. It all just feels so necessary and I genuinely like don't feel overwhelmed by the amount of songs that we were given. I just love them and I know I said that I was going to try to remain relatively neutral in my review of this Pitchfork article. I don't actually think that was possible. I couldn't contain my opinions but thank you so much for watching. I hope you got a little bit of enjoyment out of watching me read this and again I wrote an article on my website if you want to read it about my review or take on this album but again this is from a Swifties perspective it's really not critical if anything it touches on what other people have criticized slightly but it was honestly me just being in a cathartic mood at like three in the morning typing frantically on my keyboard because I wanted to get all my thoughts out there and I was getting really frustrated by a lot of the articles that I was reading and I felt like they were missing so much information about the story of this album so if you want to check it out on my website go ahead Ahead. I'll leave the link to the article in the description down below if you want to read it at any point. If not, I will read it to you right now if you want to stick around and listen to me. It is a bit long. I don't know. I might still make some edits to it, but these were just my original thoughts after sitting with the album and letting it absorb into my skin for a while. If you feel like I missed the mark on the overarching theme of this album or maybe forgot certain aspects that you thought were important, let me know in the comments down below. I'm always interested in hearing your thoughts about this type of thing. So I'm in the process of moving moving a lot of my blog posts to this new website that I created. So if you want to check it out, feel free, but I posted it under the blog. So let me read it to you guys. I titled it again. It's a bit cringy, but I was just going hard. Okay. I was just going all in to see what came out. So these are my first original thoughts. The Tortured Poets Department. Aching melody is sparked from the ashes of a treacherous walk down memory lane. A little bit dramatic, but I thought it was in the spirit of things, you know? I also wanted to write this with people who may not have been super familiar with Taylor Swift's lore in mind. So a lot of it does provide more information, more backstory, just because I thought that that might be helpful for the people that didn't know. So if it feels a bit repetitive, that's probably why. The Tortured Poets Department. Aching melody is sparked from the ashes of a treacherous walk down memory lane. With the impairments of youth and the illusion of nostalgia laying the foundation 
Taylor Swift's The Tortured Poets Department sheds light on the greatest pains that plagued her mind and intermingled with her psyche for the better part of a decade. The what ifs and the if onlys. Dropping much of the fictional veil that covered folklore and evermore, TTPD is arguably one of Swift's most vulnerable albums to date. With stripped back vocals that range from deep and sultry to high and screeching, the instruments guide the narrative evolution. Vacillating between fond memories, deep seated doubt, and the hellfire of a woman scorned, TTPD is a tumultuous trek through the barren landscape of a truly tortured poet's mind. With past regrets and missed opportunities highlighting the universal inklings that occasionally swell in the depths of our souls, Listeners are immersed in the narrator's innermost thoughts, swelling up from the shattered reflection staring at them in the mirror, pondering the question, did I choose the right road to walk down all those years ago? It's reminiscent of an unknown quote. The mark of a mature man is a certain scar he bears, the memory of a perfect woman never won, or of a once true love forever lost. However much he may love you, he is only here because she is not. I heard that quote a long time ago, back when I was like first dating my boyfriend at the time. And to me, it was one of the deepest senses of sadness when you feel like you have to move on in life because there is a memory out there of a perfect woman that you never won or you had a true love once that is now forever lost and it's always going to be a scar and no matter who you end up with in the future that person that you end up with is only in your life because that other person isn't and to me I instantly thought of this quote when I started reflecting on the pains that plagued this album because it so vividly felt like Taylor was feeling that exact thing in her relationship. If Maddie Healy was there, Joe wouldn't have been. And I think that that was a realization that she eventually came to. What happens when that lost love comes back around as a metaphorical neighbor or coworker for that matter? Do you blow up the life you've built to take the passage back in time? Do you trust that the grass is greener on the other side? If the decision wasn't hard enough, having every baby step you take magnified by millions of eyes only adds insult to injury. Yet sometimes the wondering is worse than any actual outcome could be. Indecision is a crippling feeling, but Taylor Swift has once again encapsulated this unique, specific, yet universal emotion into poetry. While torturous it may be, those who are willing to buckle up and go along for the ride through 31 songs are sure to feel a beautifully cathartic kaleidoscope of sentiments that offer cutting insights into what can happen when you choose to roll that stone away. The grass isn't always greener, but the fact that you went searching may be a sign that you needed a different lawn all along. If Speak Now was the setting sun of her childhood, the tortured poets department is the last coin spent from the currency of Swift's youth, a wish granted for a mere moment from a penny tossed into the pool years ago. TTPD is not only a reflection on the path not taken, but a heartbreaking encounter with past versions of yourself. It's a romanticization of the what could have been and the explosive realization that some time capsules are better left buried. The Tortured Poets Department is a brutally raw, courageously vulnerable journey barefoot through the grass that got painted greener for a fortnight or two before being coated in the pitch black ink of betrayal and disillusionment. Steeped in the labyrinth of her mind, the tortured poetry poured out like tears on a manuscript. The Tortured Poets Department broke me in ways I never expected. In the days following the release of The Tortured Poets Department and the anthology, I was fighting to keep my head above the depressive waters I found myself in. I couldn't figure out why. Then it dawned on me. No heartbreak hits quite like the realization that Taylor's fans were the ones who deeply hurt her. There's no doubt that certain poignant lines, such as the bridge of But Daddy I Love Him, were directly speaking to a subset of Swifty stands who started a Speak Up Now movement online, encouraging Swift to end her fresh fling with the 19th singer Maddie Healy due to his long history of controversial statements. I'll tell you something right now, I'd rather burn my whole life down than listen to one more second of all this bitching and moaning. I'll tell you something about my good name, it's mine alone to disgrace. I don't cater to all these vipers dressed in empaths clothing. God save the most judgmental creeps who say they want what's best for me, sanctimoniously performing soliloquies I'll never see, thinking it can change the beat of my heart when he touches me and counteract the chemistry and undo the destiny. You ain't gotta pray for me, me and my wild boy, and all this wild joy. If all you want is gray for me, then it's just white noise and it's just my choice. Perhaps one of her most scathing bridges to date, the lyrics exist inside a much larger metaphor, something Taylor Swift has always done well. In this way, Swift's writing almost creates two parallel storylines, that of a small town good girl running off with the bad boy and being judged by the morally righteous in the town, and one that mirrors her own life as a celebrity, and the scrutiny that comes along with that ferocity of public opinion. Using extended metaphors as a literary device in her songwriting doesn't stop there. 
picture. In fact, it's eloquently used throughout TTPD to paint a much more nuanced picture of the album's theme. We can see this in Down Bad, which relates love bombing to an alien abduction, where it feels like your lover opened up a whole new world for you to see, then took it all away. Similar to Plato's allegory of the cave, Swift's hometown feels so hollow now that she has experienced a bigger world. However, those who never left the planet or saw beyond the shadows of the cave wall will say she's nuts for even talking about the existence of this grander love. The beautiful imagery and tragic lyricism in the song Chloe or Sam or Sophia or Marcus are sure to put listeners in an emotional chokehold as every line stings. In Embodying the deep cuts of nostalgia and loss in its score, the pain is palpable, reminiscing on a decade that played two people for fools. However, it also touches on a more serious subject matter that had yet to be explored in Swift's discography, loving a drug addict. You need me, but you needed drugs more, and I couldn't watch it happen. I changed into goddesses, villains, and fools, changed plans and lovers and outfits and rules, all to outrun my desertion of you, and you just watched it. While painfully honest and ruthlessly relatable for so many, the incessant wondering if this person loved you the way that you were before you grew up and got molded by life's hurts continues to be heartbreaking as listeners move throughout the verses, chorus, and bridge. Another standout track from this album is Who's Afraid of Little Old Me, which Swift described as just a song about being crazy in a voice memo of the first draft. She introduced the song on the radio as something she wrote alone sitting at the piano in a moment of bitterness. Swift went on to describe the odd sense of masochism that has plagued the public's perception of writers and creatives, noting that we love to watch artists in pain, often to the point where I think sometimes as a society we provoke that pain and we just watch what happens. There's no denying that Taylor Swift's pain has been profitable, from the childhood bullying that sparked her initial need for songwriting to the high school boys who did her wrong. Taking the emotions from real life experiences and turning them into art is a foundational element of the creative process that Swift mastered all those years ago. Understandably, the tightrope of fame became harder to walk on the further Swift rose on that ladder of success. Deciphering song lyrics became a sport, not only for those who wanted to relate to her lyrics on a deeper level, but for gossip blogs and celebrity news sites, eagerly searching for the next headline. Swift's success as a songwriter is largely due to the authenticity and vulnerability she's maintained in her lyrics throughout her high-profile career. The open door of communication Swift has built with her fans is foundational, allowing them to feel like they know her. Cleverly, underneath the themes of heartbreak, the tortured poets department is layered with a commentary on celebrity nature and, at times, a seemingly direct response to the invasive opinions of a fandom. While possibly jarring for the casual listener, unfamiliar with the intricacies of Swift's personal affairs, those who are well-versed in the Swifty universe recognize Who's Afraid of Little Old Me as an album highlight. With layers of lyrical depth that compare fame to a circus life and asylum, the haunting production matches its emotional resonance. A lot was going on at the moment TTPD was created. The start of 2023 was alight with sparks, writing the coattails of praise from Swift's massively successful rollout of her 10th studio album, Midnight's. While the widely anticipated Eras tour kicked off in March, news of her breakup with actor Joe Alwyn, after over six years of dating, broke less than a month later. In May 2023, Swift was romantically linked to the 1975's Maddie Healy, but the whirlwind romance was reportedly over by June. In July, Kansas City Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey attended Swift's Eras tour show in hopes of giving her a friendship bracelet with his number on it. While the two didn't connect that night, someone was playing matchmaker behind the scenes because they reportedly started hanging out in August and publicly announced their relationship in September when Taylor attended one of Travis's games. In October, still amid a global tour, Swift's re-recorded album 1989 Taylor's version came out, just three months after Speak Now Taylor's version. If that wasn't enough for a single calendar year, in December, Taylor Swift was announced as Time's Person of the Year for 2023, which came with an iconic interview that shed light on the Taylor Swift effect and the pressure of carrying economies on the back of her sequin starred silhouette. With the announcement of her 11th studio album in February of 2024, many fans were understandably preparing to be quenched by the tea of Swift's diaristic songwriting. While there were several muses and major life events that could have occupied space on the album, fans were quite convinced Swift's long-term relationship with Alwyn would take up most of it. Instead, we were given So Long London and the ballad How Did It End, where she referenced the descending empathetic hunger and put that curiosity into humble perspective. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a songwriter in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a love story. In fact, Taylor Swift has spent most of her life trying to put love into words. However, immediate comments about how a heart-wrenching breakup would lead to the following album being fire were understandably insensitive and dehumanizing. Plus, an album closer like The Manuscript helps listeners make sense of Swift's songwriting process with the lyrics and the tears fell in synchronicity with the score. And at last, she knew what the agony had been for. The only thing that's left is The Manuscript, one last souvenir from my trip to your
Your Shores. Now and then I reread the manuscript, but the story isn't mine anymore. While this perspective may make it sound like little information was shared about the deterioration of her long-term relationship that couldn't be further from the truth, Swift referred to songwriting as a life raft while making TTPD, inevitably leaving fans with a trail of breadcrumbs to follow. Connecting the dots isn't simply done for the purposes of entertainment though. The tortured poets department not only entrances the listener in the story Swift is creating, but it encourages you to create your own connections with each song, applying lyrics to your own life and extracting truths that only you can keep. That is part of the magic of Swift's music and why her loyal fan base is so unbreakable. Listeners feel less alone in their lives by gaining insight into hers. Understanding the nuances of Swift's discography has become akin to studying literature, identifying themes and motifs, extracting lessons, and analyzing how every morally ambiguous shade of gray can apply to decisions we've made in our own lives. Taylor Swift's songs embody emotions we've all felt. She simply dares to write them down and courageously sings about them for the whole world to hear. TTPD is another step away from the girlhood ideals that painted her earlier work and into a much more brutal adult world where decisions catch up to you and the realities of practicality intersect with the dwindling hope of that youthful naivete. The song Guilty as Sin could be moral ambiguities representative. It begs the question, is emotional cheating actual infidelity? However, it isn't the only song that reveals some of Swift's more personal demons. The Black Dog paints an intimate picture of the moment you realize an ex forgot to turn their location off on their phone, encapsulating the impending emotional spiral in the piercing line, old habits die screaming. Other song lyrics on TTPD have been deemed cringy or embarrassing, such as the line, you smoked then ate seven and bars of chocolate from the title track. However, these lyrics are often the gate from specificity to vulnerability, so listeners should be encouraged to understand the importance of such lines. The title track continues by referring to the relationship as a cyclone that Swift chose, but the bridge puts everything into perspective. At dinner, you take my ring off my middle finger and put it on the one people put wedding rings on, and that's the closest I've come to my heart exploding. Although this newfound love may not be perfect, it's bringing her back to life and making her feel again in ways her long-term relationship never did, which helps the listener understand, justify, or even relate to that exact experience. The production matches the emotion. TTPD moves between harsh sounds and melodic structures that mimic the sting of the lyrics, while also offering a stripped-back production that reveals the vulnerability in Swift's songwriting. The production is a result of Swift's close collaboration with Jack Antonoff and Aaron Dessner. The sound of TTPD is a culmination of many genres and a musical mosaic in and of itself. Listeners move through upbeat pop bops like I Can Do It With a broken heart or so high school, to the heart-wrenching melancholic sound of Chloe or Sam or Sophia or Marcus, to the repetition in a piano ballad like Peter, to the country twang and saloon vibes of I can fix him, no really I can, to the wrath that can be felt in the screeching production of Who's Afraid of Little Old Me, and so many sounds in between. The 31 song track list will take you to many different places, but while you're listening, you'll realize that there's no other place you'd rather be. Like the emotions and subject matter it embodies, the Tortured Poets department is deep, reaching vast corners of the music industry and pushing Taylor Swift creatively to a new level. Not everyone will love the unguarded, occasionally unflattering light such vulnerability paints Swift in. Not everyone will be happy about receiving two albums at once. The casual listener may be frustrated by the depths of the lore-filled water they have to wade through to connect with certain songs or lyrics, and that's okay, because those who take the time to get it, get it. More than any other album, Swift needed to make this one. And while certain lines felt particularly pointed, what a gift every word was. Not every fandom is awarded the opportunity opportunity to grow and evolve with an artist determined to challenge themselves creatively, but it truly is an unbelievable privilege. Plus, the Swifties that have been around for a while aren't surprised by the musical evolution. As a 20-year-old Taylor Swift once said, I think it's important that you know that I will never change, but I'll never stay the same either. Must be a Sagittarius thing. Okay, so that was my article. I hope you guys liked it. Thanks so much for listening. Feel free to give me feedback or tips, tricks, pointers. This was so fun to write. I genuinely had a blast doing it and I'd love to know what you thought of it. I feel like it was probably a little too Swiftian to be able to be published in one of the normal publications, but that's why I have my blog. I found that it was interesting to try to balance the lore and the context clues, the theme of the album with the lyrics and how those all intermingle with the melodic structure of the songs and the musicality and the production. I don't tend to talk a lot about like the production itself, but I felt like that was important to touch on. So again, let me know what you guys thought. Let me know if you felt like it was relatively well balanced or if I leaned too far into one direction or the other. This is again, so much fun. And I like to think that my review is better than Pitchfork because Pitchfork gave this a freaking D. I would probably give the Torture Poets Department at least 
a 92 at least that would be another interesting concept to understand like what i would take points off for Ooh, i need to ponder that because i don't actually know let me know what you guys think if you had to rate it what would your rating be why what would you take points off for i genuinely don't see how they got to a 6.6 .6 out of 10 i think it's at least a 9.2 but this is just another thing that i think is important to touch on because with midnights it got so many good reviews that i feel like everyone was just in the era of being nice to taylor swift and not to say her work didn't deserve it or that it wasn't worthy of the praise that it got but i just find it peculiar that this album which is in no way shape or form less of a masterpiece than midnight's was if anything i think it's better i don't understand why it would get rated less than Midnight's did unless it's just a shifting of the tides a shifting of the public opinion and I knew this was gonna happen I knew this day would come because it genuinely is like a pendulum swing when you are a person in the public eye I could tell that we were getting to this point with the success of the Eras tour with Taylor dating an NFL star being on our TVs all the time I knew it was a matter of time before people started getting sick of her to the point where they wanted to criticize the work and the art that she was creating she was very aware of this because in the phone call that she had with Kanye she said that she felt in her 1989 era that she was getting very close to overexposure. When you're everywhere, people inevitably start getting sick of you. Well, not everyone, but a lot of people in the masses tend to get a little tired of you if you're just everywhere all the time and you're not like an obsessive fan. So she was keenly aware of that overexposure risk in 1989. And then it ended up catastrophically crumbling when basically Snakegate happened and she got canceled. And I feel like the difference now is that Taylor does not care as much about the public's opinion or the public perception of her the way that she did during the 1989 era and that's where I think this is slightly different but we know that Taylor cares about her art her work her legacy where she is on the charts what ratings she's getting from critical reviewers and so I unfortunately feel like a lot of the reviews of this album are just a product of the time that we're in and the teetering into the overexposure that was was inevitable coming off of this leg of the heiress tour so i think it's important to recognize that a lot of these reviews are veiled with everything else that's going on outside of just the music itself but anyway thank you guys so much for watching i hope you enjoyed this video don't forget to like and subscribe share it with someone that you think might find it interesting and let me know in the comments down below what you want to see from me next i love you guys so much and i'll see you in the next video a heart speed to the city streets we begin to feel the fire we rise like tall buildings As the chemicals, they take us higher The night's young And it's just beautiful